Hello to all you wildlife warriors. It is time for another episode of the Conservationist Assembled podcast, where we team up with the Earth's mightiest defenders to learn about the diverse species and landscapes that make our planet so incredible. Today's episode is all about the Gordon's Wildcat, and we've got an extra special guest who's an expert on these little felines. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Alex Sliwa. Okay, so, so Alex, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. How are you? Thank you, uh, Johnny. No, I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, I'm very excited to discuss with you today um, about uh, the Gordon's Wildcat specifically and, and your kind of expertise within both actually in situ and ex situ conservation as to, to try and link the two together and how they work. Um, so firstly, then, can you tell us a little bit about the physiological and, and ecological traits of of the uh, Gordon's wildcat. Yes, no, it's a pleasure. Um, so yeah, the Gordon's wildcat, I think, for an untrained viewer, would look like a like a tabby house cat, you know. So it's not, it's a, it's quite a specialized view to s- distinguish a, a Gordon's wildcat. Is it's essentially an Arabian wildcat? And um, taxonomically, it belongs to the recently split two species of wildcats. You know, the one is the forest wildcat, which is also the one that is in Scotland, you know, Scottish wildcat. And then the second one is the so-called African Asian wildcat. And the Gordon's wildcat is just a small population of this African Asian wildcat. But it's it's uh, restricted to Oman, the Sultanate of, of Oman, and the United Arab Emirates. So in the essentially northeasternmost range of the African wildcat, and uh, it's a pale, quite small uh, desert version of this uh, of this uh, species or subspecies. So uh, females are around two and a half kilos, and males three and a half to four kilos. So a bit smaller than your average house cat, you know, definitely not a, a huge house mm. cat's like a Maine Coon or something, sure. but it's a, your normal short haired uh, um, house cat. And um, yeah, physiologically, you can say that, you know, um, African wildcat are, are a very um, tough and adaptable species. So they are able to survive under savanna uh, conditions from 40 degrees plus up to minus 15 so it's uh, uh but more more restricted to the to the drier climates um although there are some populations which are obviously in in uh, precipitation areas which are similar to where we live here in in Europe um but this particular gordon's wildcat is definitely adapted to very dry conditions it lives in the deserts around the cities of dubai um uh, sharjah uh, different emirates and obviously the type specimen was described in 1968 only by Harrison um, and it's it, uh, it came from Sohar which is the north of, um, of the Sultanate of, of Oman. Um, you could actually describe it as sort of a, a pale small African wildcat you know very faint barring on the on the sides of the of the body um, characteristic of the African wildcat in general is it has rusty colored backs of the ears um, there is no pure white. It has sort of an off-white underside and a bit of white on the on the nose, but but there's actually no real white, which makes it the only way to really distinguish it from a from a hybridized or a domestic cat, uh, which have often white on their paws, on their faces, on the underside, or they even piebald. Um, yeah, and it's 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 a remarkably tough species that can live almost as as uh, effectively as let's say the sand cat which is a, a more even extremely adapted species to the desert conditions of of this area yeah that's about it and and obviously it, it survives with very low prey densities but i think we'll we'll get to that <laughs> yes i'm sure yes so so then what are you kind of classification wise um and, and and obviously then you know throughout its history of of taxon taxonomy um what are we kind of establishing the the population trend and and number and and um classification of of the gordon's wildcat at at the moment 
That's actually a, a big dilemma because because it's difficult to you know obviously the old taxonomy said it's a subspecies of Felis sylvestris you know the the wildcat at that time and uh, obviously in the last century over the last century a number of so-called subspecies were described from the Arabian Peninsula uh, including Tristrami and and Iraqi and 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 other ones and and the Gordon's wildcat has been separated just by by this by size wise and by also by the, by its coloration but obviously this is a uh, phenotypic so externally visible uh, visible characteristics it wasn't really manifested in in um, bodily conditions let's say i mean like there was no no clear cut difference to this other subspecies by let's say the skull skull measurements or or bodily me measurements although it is said that the uh, auditory bullae, which are containing the inner ear of these cats are is exceptionally large, which is sort of, an, um, it's similar to, let's say, the, the sand cat, which also works mostly to capture its prey by, by hearing. Uh, so so these, this is an indication uh, for cats that they can actually hear if they have exceptionally large uh, um, auditory bullae. Okay, so then we determine that, that their primary sense is by the size of the ear and then maybe if they've sacrificed other senses the the features would be smaller yes of course and and obviously you know like all cats uh, the gordon's wildcat has exceptionally good vision uh, i mean a very very sharp vision uh good night vision um that's that's general generally for the uh holds true for all the feelets all the all the members of the cat family and then with regards to night vision are they primarily nocturnal or kind of crepuscular or are they active in the day as well? Yes, that's exactly the point. Um, obviously, a large part of the year, uh, temperatures are very high in the desert areas. Uh, I mean, in this this part of the range, it goes up to 50 degrees. And uh, so it's very difficult to be active for a mammal in these kind of temperatures. And obviously also the prey animals of these cats, which are ranging from insects, uh, reptiles, depending on the year or of the time of the year. Uh, rodents are probably the, the mainstay. And then also birds are available more easily for this cat. Definitely the rodents are outside of the burrow at that time. Uh, so the cat is actually adapting its its activity pattern towards the activity pattern of its, of its prey. Okay, so then with Obviously, we, we, we're probably going to, well, we'll definitely discuss the, the, the major threat to, to this species, which is, is hybridization. Um, with then climate change, and, and are we seeing an impact on climate change to their behavioral pattern or, or kind of the window that they have for such activities as, as hunting um, in this particular species? It is, obviously, it's diffi very difficult to prove in this species, subspecies, because obviously, if you want to prove climate change effects, you have to study a, a large number of individuals by telemetry, looking at their behavior, looking at their long term development, survival, uh, and so on. But but it's it's highly likely that climate change, if that would include a rise in temperature and a drying out of the area would affect the species a lot um, by, you know, pushing it past the its, its ecological uh, capabilities, um, because then actually the sand cats takes over, you know, if it gets more hot and more dry, uh, the, the, the wildcat is at its limits. Right. If it would get wetter, you know, I mean, like I am not an expert for the climate change predicted for this area, mm. get wetter, it will probably have an effect that these cats would maybe even get bigger and darker, depending on the, on the amount of vegetation um and and so on but obviously this region where these cats are the golden's wildcat lives um is a highly favored area for human activity so, right. so obviously you have the mega cities of dubai and Sharjah, other emirates uh, there's a huge amount of tourism uh, development um also northern oman is definitely in in uh, developing at this moment so the impact of human beings on this desert environment is increasing okay so then let's discuss the main threat um of of gwc which is is uh hybridization um how you know how does that begin how do we combat that and, and how can zoos um maintain kind of genetic diversity yeah, yeah, yeah. um 
Well, first of all, um, the Gordon's wildcat is essentially the wild for one of the wild forms, the, the, the essentially the wild form of our domesticated cat, which then in many cases goes feral because um, people don't care for it, you know, don't keep it in their home. They, 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 uh, these feral domestic cats are actually feeding off garbage uh, uh, are close to the dumps and they are they usually also reservoirs of diseases but the main threat is really that these cats which are favored by human activities i mean these feral cats are interbreeding with these gordon's wild cat with these wild forebearers so so the the, the genetic uh, um, integrity of this subspecies of this population is threatened uh, increasingly and actually the the zoos or the captive centers, which are keeping Gordon's wild cats, are you know they they trying to preserve the original of these cats by keeping a pure uh, population of them for the future, and and that is by maintaining them over long time periods, uh, keeping some form of breeding uh, going. Uh, although I must admit, yeah, I've been I've been looking after the stud book for for now more than twenty five years. The interest. Is very limited from from zoos. It's it's not easy because um, this this wildcat looks so similar to a tabby, uh, and 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 the general public doesn't see the point, you know, to preserve something that is not as exotic. Obviously, if you mm. compete with uh, whatever a fishing cat or an ocelot or a sand cat, <laughs> it's it's more difficult to um, to get zoos and their visitors actually fired up for this species but it, it, it fulfills a very important role by preserving the genetic integrity of such a population so then how many um because you say that there's not many zoos housing gordon's wildcats how many currently would you say are in europe um in europe that's only uh 22 i just had a look we have an online uh, um, um tool uh, where, where everybody enters their information so it's it's less than a bit less than half of them are in Europe. Uh, the other half is actually in Oman and and in the United Emirates, and the total population currently is 58, uh, 58 Gordon's wildcats. So the population is small, and also the the founder base is very small. It's it's based on just six founders, um, and obviously it it would be very beneficial to expand that. You know to yes. to be able to include more wild court founders. After checking, obviously, once you caught them, you need to genetically check them uh, if there's any introgression of domestic or feral cats. Um, yeah, but that's, as I said, it's a, it's a small population. Yeah. Hopefully we'll uh, get some more um, people involved with it and, and hopefully more collections will start realising the importance of, of yes. housing these, these, these species soon. Yes. So what role do Gordon's wildcats play within their wider ecosystem? It's the Gordon's wildcat is one of the small predators which fulfills a, a, a critical function in 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 the balance of of an ecosystem by controlling rodent rodent numbers, being a selecting agent uh, for diversity. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's like every every species on this earth. You know, we has an ecological role, and and obviously it has a it has that effect and and. Also, I mean, it, it's not really a, a strong prey animal, you know, because they are in very low densities available. But but still, a desert environment being so low in in, in um, biomass, it's 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 definitely an important species for, on this respect. And then, with regards to to conservation as a whole, what actions need to happen to help secure a future for for this particular subspecies? Unfortunately, this is quite an ambitious uh, undertaking if we want to secure it. So we, we actually have to make sure um, the governments, the people of the two countries uh, are aware of the, of the plight of this subspecies. Um, so it would actually mean that there has to be a control of the feral domestic cats uh, by neutering those which are not being taken care of, which is highly difficult. Uh, I mean, this has been the problem in many regions of the world. Uh, I mean, in Southern Africa, for instance, you also have hybridized uh, African wild, Southern African wildcat populations. The most famous is definitely the Scottish wildcat, uh, where you have a lot of introgression, almost actually there's very few purebred left. And there's currently a breeding project and release project uh, going on in Scotland, which I'm also advising to. Um, 
Um, so yes, it's there has to be an awareness in the United Emir Emirates and Oman. And once you can control, obviously, these feral cat populations, you would have then a breeding potential from those captive ones and releasing them and, and propagating them. I mean, maybe maybe even some of the last pure Gordon's wildcat out there in the wild are able to rebound and to regain their uh, yeah their habitat and and maintain a, a yeah I mean actually the the perfect adaptation to this desert environment. So then, how can you know everyone get involved with the conservation because obviously it's for such a you know a small population and and such a small region um what is something that the you know the wider public can do to help get involved with with this kind of conservation project well first of all i think i think it's really important is the awareness you know to be aware that this is a this is a native species it's not a domestic one you know and it's it is of value you know it is rare and and being aware that there's a strong impact by humans and their domesticated animals or you know feral animals so i think that's number one and then obviously by this public awareness and pressure in 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 generating funds or or making sure you know these this is recognized and there is there is more support uh, for this captive population i mean what we would definitely need to release animals again is to expand the captive population i mean normally you would need at least 120, 200 animals as a breeding stock, you know, to generate enough animals for a release, you know, just, a, just as, as a sort of ballpark um, for a small cat. If you want to have a continued release over five to 10 years, you should release roughly between 10 and 20 animals per year. Right. And to be able for a population to generate this, you need a, a large enough breeding pool. And for that, obviously, it would be it would make the biggest sense actually to establish such a breeding center in the range country. So in one of the Emirates or in several Emirates and in the Sultanate of Oman. Um, so I think the public has to be aware that this is one of their native wildcat species. And it's obviously it's a beautiful species. I mean, it's just that we are so used to domestic cats all around us. It's a very popular animal. Um, and maybe they're not aware, you know, this is a wild species and, and it's, it's worth, the saving and worth our attention and i think that's this this would be definitely the focus obviously if people are able to donate or if people schools are able to concentrate in teaching children and doing activities in in prop in sort of yeah making even their parents you know the children can bring it back to their parents aware that this is a native species and it needs it needs the intention it needs our intervention of you know, deterioration of the environment and our impact. Yeah. I think that flows nicely into my next point then. Um, certainly we know that aside from having, you know, a, a, a stock or a population of, of animals that, that are genetically viable, should something take a turn for the worst in, in these home ranges, um, zoos are incredibly important for funding and, and education. And it's not just because we want to do those things, but it's actually a legal requirement of, mm. of certainly well-governed zoos to, to do those things. So what kind of, of research or, or resources does public and, and zoo funding contribute towards? Well, zoos depend... I mean, this is, depends a lot, you know, on on what, how do you define a zoo and where that zoo is located, and the and the obviously the economical situation of that zoo. So, so let's say here in Germany, most zoos are city owned or or state owned. Um, so they a large proportion of the funding for a zoo and maintaining the animals and 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 everything comes from also from the public. So it's it is it is supported by the public, and only a smaller part is coming from the re revenues from the zoo. So it's actually largely uh, uh, non-commercial. Obviously, those zoos need to look after their funds. Uh, and and But in general, um, the Gordon's wildcat is a very hardy species. It's, it doesn't require uh, a large amount of funds and, and keeping staff. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not difficult to keep uh, and it's quite hardy. So, so luckily, um, uh, it will not require a lot. Obviously, nowadays which is good um, a good exhibit should reflect 
the natural environment of a species. And, and obviously in the past, we held small wildcats in very small and very Im environmentally impoverished enclosures. So, so those should be much better furnished, much, much more reflecting the, the natural habitat. And obviously with this uh, feeds and the education to, to the public, and uh, yeah, I think I think it's a it's a cru crucial role zoos and the public can play in pushing this this Gordon's wildcat and and making it aware. You know, this is this is the this is the ancestor of our domestic cat, which is obviously um, domesticated in a crescent uh, uh, in a fertile fertile crescent. So so essentially in in Iran Iraq area, uh, but that's not far from from uh, the Emirates or, or Oman. So we, we're not even nowadays 100% sure that all the domestic cats came from there. Maybe there have been several centers of domestication. It's really interesting. And you have given us a, a you know a really crucial insight as to, to how you know we've got to where we are with Gordon's wildcats and, and what we can do going forward. So now I'd like to focus on, on you for a little bit and, and talk to you about your career and, and in a sense of paying it forward obviously it helps hopefully inspire the next wave of, of conservationists so firstly then when did you you or what drew you to working with with Gordon's Wildcats um well this is a long question this is a this is quite a long long uh thing uh question to me you know I'm I would consider myself I'm I'm a wildlife biologist by training and uh, my interest in cats and wildlife has been very long. You know, it's uh, I think my my parents told me I, I was interested from about four years old, <laughs> four years of age, and and the cats have always been my focus and interest. And uh, particularly the older I got, and and actually through zoos, my interest was stimulated by that. It really focused on the smaller wild cats, you know, not just tigers, lions, leopards, jaguars. Um, and actually, the first Gordon's wildcat I've been seeing at uh, at Bupatal Zoo, and uh, which is um, about sixty kilometers from Cologne Zoo, where I'm working currently, uh, and where I was curator um, sixteen years before I started working here. Um, generally, my interest I came as a I came into the zoo world in the professional zoo world um, as a as a wildlife biologist. So I did my my master's on birds in Jamaica, and I did my, my PhD on artwolf, which is a hyena relative in South Africa. And my real passion then turned onto the black-footed cat, which is in the same habitat in South Africa, and which I've been working on 32 years in the wild and also in captivity. Um, and obviously my interest has then diversified onto sand cats, which I'm also quite well known by now. And obviously also this desert adapted wildcat, uh, which is the Gordon's wildcat, or you could call it the North African uh, uh, wildcat. Um, yes, and I, I, I must just say, I've been, I've been stubborn in pursuing my career. <laughs> I've been trying to, to just hold on uh, to my dream in researching these animals in the wild. Uh, um, and I had a long, long period of fasting. <laughs> I didn't find a job easily. And uh, but I thought, you know, I, I had I had this determination on in holding on and writing and, and reading up and then finally actually doing this research uh, after people started believing that I can actually do it. Uh, um, so I definitely I owe this to the Blackfooted Cat, which I, I was really pursuing really hard. And, and I could show people, you know, I would produce data, I would produce photographs, so I was producing reports. Uh, so these Mostly NGOs and zoos started believing in my abilities, and I think I can only the, um, yeah ad advise people who want to get into this. You have to pursue your dream, and it's it's a long stretch. It it will take <laughs> take you a long time. You, you may be lucky, um, but yeah, it's it's economically quite tough. And and uh, to be to be just very very honest, uh, I had my first paid job with thirty four. Uh, so so this is a this is a very long stretch. Um, but I can only, you know, I can only encourage people. Um, that's the only way to start, particularly on a on a less known, less sexy, if you would say, like this uh, uh, wildlife. Let's say elephant, gorillas, rhinos. Uh, it's the megafauna, you know, lions. Every, everybody wants to do research on. And I obviously, as a child, also thought, wow, tigers are fantastic. I still like tigers, but obviously, the small wildcats uh, were really not 
not uh, taken care of enough. So I really focused on that, and I'm I must say I'm 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 very happy, and I I'm I'm by now quite well known for them. Yeah, there's a reason why, like to say, those <laughs> mega fauna are are still you know talked about in in everyday yeah. conservation, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's incredibly crucial to try and get every species up to that standard so yeah i think it's it's great that you've you've you know dedicated your career to these smaller less recognized uh the species and um, it's would you say there's one lesson that that you know small cats have, have taught you um i think incredible endurance um i'm i'm over and again impressed how these cats survive and 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 sorry to say i've seen a lot of them die you know it's a it's 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 not all positive i mean the the, the living in the wild um although it's romanticized by by people particularly those who are who are living in cities and who, who don't know you know what the hardship is um can be extremely tough and just you know that that will to survive and to just make make it and 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 it's not just food getting enough food but also surviving uh, the onslaught of of predators, you know, which are after them and killing them, um, and but also the the, the massive human impact, um, it's is really increasing. <clears throat> so we really have to be aware of it. And 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 I'm over and again, you know, fascinated how these these animals should just survive. And and obviously cats are famous for this, you know, they're, with their nine lives. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> it's the epitome, you know, of survival. And. And I, I obviously enjoy cats a lot and, and and just reading their behavior, watching them. And luckily, all the three species I've worked on, the three species I've been able to watch directly. I, I don't have to, you know, look at my at my laptop and look at the GPS locations of these animals. I actually get to see them and enjoy them. And yeah, so this is the lesson. It's essentially survival and and wittiness to to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I've never really considered where the phrase nine lives, you know, originated from. But to hear you say about the resiliency, it's yeah, yeah. it's 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 quite fitting. And, and I suppose something that, yeah, when we, we most often refer to to nine lives within domestic cats, but. And, and, and in, in more of a lighthearted way, but I suppose, yeah, it does very much ring true for these wild species. Yes. So. So you've mentioned you're you're now curator at, at Cologne Zoo, um, and and we know there's no such thing as a, a typical day within you know conservation. But what does, for lack of a better word, con a, a typical day look like for you? So I'm I'm responsible most, mostly for mammals here at the zoo. Um, I had I have shifted quite a lot. I started as a primate curator, <laughs> then had fifteen different large enclosure building projects so i had to learn a lot about, about building exhibits for animals but um yeah my my primary role in europe for the european associations of zoos and aquaria is that i'm the the chair of the essentially cat specialist group so it's called the feel it taxon advisory group so i'm i'm essentially since 21 years overseeing all the cat breeding programs in this association with more than 300 zoos being part of it uh, and that's scientifically led zoos. So, so I'm very concerned. I'm very much involved in breeding programs on tigers, Siberian and, and Sumatran, on Asiatic lions, on sand cat, on jaguars, on different leopard subspecies. So I, I do a lot of communication uh, towards these programs. If there's any problem somewhere in Europe, you know, with communication between holders and the coordinators who are coordinating these programs, I'm helping. But I'm also very involved in several reintroduction or breeding programs for reintroduction starting from the iberian lynx in 2004 um, scottish wildcat persian leopard um, and currently actually eurasian, eurasian lynx so that's sort of my my desk job <laughs> but i'm also involved obviously I have, i'm responsible for an african riverine exhibit so i deal with hippos and and all the animals in this exhibit and I'm also responsible for for all the big cats and the bears and uh, and the whole South American section, you know, starting from from reptiles, amphibians up to uh, uh, tapers. Um, so this is sort of my managerial work, um, looking after thirty keepers. I'm an, I'm their direct direct boss. Um, conservation. I'm 
working on particularly for the for the black footed cat which is really my focus my personal focus even before zeus but actually facilitated hugely by my connection with zeus without that i would have never been able to to pursue this in this way and and cologne zoo grants me the opportunity to do some of that research and conservation in my working time so whenever i go to south africa or namibia uh, the zoo is actually sending me as a yeah it's a, it's a work it's a work day if I'm out there in, in, in the field. So, and it entails a lot of communication with the people in the field, generating funds, writing newsletters, and and but I'm obviously also connecting. Um, I'm member of the IUCN Cat Specialist Group since uh, 1995, so so a long time. And actually, I'm very much in contact with the chairs of that Cat Specialist Group on anything that's sort of related with captive cats uh, and 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 the link to those in the wild and and we need increasingly more connection between those two the wild and well-run zoos and and zoos with a conservation mind obviously there is zoos which are not very good you know they're mainly for for display or amusement but that's not what what we definitely want in zoos we have to have a, a conservation educational message as well and uh, not not just a message, actually a, a true involvement. Uh, yeah, so that's that's my day, and it's uh, every day is different. And and obviously, I'm I'm often requested as a specialist, not just on cats. Uh, I'm I'm also a specialist on on elephant shrews, sengis. I'm a specialist on on small deer. <laughs> um, I I have worked on the uh, lion tail macaque for a long time. It's a primate from southern India. So yeah, it's my zoo career. I'm, I'm, I could say I'm, I'm definitely a zoologist who enjoys all kinds of animals. And and um, as I said, I did my masters on birds. I'm I'm a I'm a professional ornithologist, but also a bird watcher. So so I thoroughly enjoy um, wild animals, both in the wild and well kept ones in captivity. Yeah, that's a so short overview. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's great. I could listen to you go on. Um, and yeah, certainly quite an array of species under your belt, but also quite a range of, of duties um, within your career or over your, your career. Um, so then going forward, what else would you like to achieve in your career? I think I'm I'm extremely happy with what I've achieved so far, <laughs> and I obviously want to continue with the projects I'm involved with, and I'm to a certain degree also open for future more projects. You know, I I just touched lightly on it. You know, there is large projects on African lions in the in particularly the northern African lions. Um, I'm definitely open to anyone who's uh, any people working in the wild on animals that want sort of this captive component and and uh, and I'm always happy to make the connection to zoos and through the through the connection of zoos to the public and in in funding, you know, generating funding for in situ projects. I think that's that's really important, and 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 that will stay with me even if I retire. You know, I I will probably be considered and contacted by lots of different people, both in the zoo world, but also in the one in the wild luckily i have a foot in both both realms uh, uh, strongly uh, through also publication and and trying to make that link the whole time so that's really my dream to bring both closer and actually the opportunity of a good zoo to show an animal that in the wild would be very hard to observe i think that's a that's a unique opportunity and good zoos obviously also have very good educational departments they have a zoo school so they run a lot of children through it, and 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 it's a it's it's really a good opportunity for children to actually f see that animal, and it's it 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 stirs a connection that is much stronger than through a film. Although you know some people who are uh, zoo opponents don't think so; they think everything can be done virtually. But I I just I definitely don't believe in it. It's a it's a difference if you see and by yourself, you know, on your own time, how an animal behaves, how it smells, how it sounds. It's it's a it's a major achievement and and it's a it, it's a formative process to to be able to do this definitely for me I, I I grew up with zoos in different parts and and I that really formed my my love for nature too um, yeah so that's one of the achievement I'm hoping to I think go for. yeah it's it's incredibly you know revitalizing um, to you know, to hear not just yourself but a lot of 
of keepers and, and people involved with zoos in this day and age to acknowledge that, you know, while there are a lot of conservation minded zoos that, that, you know, we are not just educating the public, but we are also trying to educate those those zoos that aren't hmm. quite up to, to standard to to improve. We're not saying that they they shouldn't exist, but we're saying that, that you know, there's certainly room to improve and, and that they are, you know, an incredibly important role within conservation and, and that they should be a mainstay, certainly while the you know the status of biodiversity globally is in the state that it is in that you know we we should continue what we're doing because it is incredibly important yes i totally agree <laughs> so knowing what you know now when you were first looking to get involved in in conservation what advice would you give to yourself or what advice would you give to someone who is just starting out their career within conservation it's that's a difficult one i mean obviously you have to be open you it's never enough to to network <laughs> obviously when i didn't have a secure job i was essentially in research and at the same time always in conservation um, I had this great sense of insecurity and, and I, I always wanted to, but it's it's important to to meet people, to address people, to write emails, to go by, to make connections, to go to presentations, um, anything that's not just virtual. Um, it's the, the human factor is huge. Um, that personal part uh, is I can I can just stress, you know, people, People are, yeah, we are humans. So, so we are looking at at uh, not just um, images or or written things. We are also connect through, yeah, body language and so on. And I think I think it helps. And and I, and my my advice is really, yeah, try to try to connect. It's 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 highly important. And and um, um, it's sometimes a bit difficult, obviously, because if you want to work on wild animals, you have this sort of image in your head you know i want to work in the wild and i want to <laughs> i want to be um you know out there and um but i can just tell you uh, the human part is is massive you have to always deal with people i mean it's for permits for research for funding um to connect with people it's it's really important and i i, I obviously i'm not the best person to give advice on that <laughs> because i really uh, but yeah, in a way, I, I was lucky, and and um, yeah, I, I, I somehow pulled through, and and it worked out, and and uh, and you get better, obviously, you know, I, you overcome your your shyness and your initial hesitations by also becoming more confident through your own work. So if you specialized in something, at some point people want your advice, and and people want your expertise, and 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 that gives you more and more confidence and 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 by that you get obviously more connections and the second thing is obviously staying staying with a subject if you jump around all the time and uh, i think stability is important um you cannot expect to become an expert in one year huh? i mean it's it will it will take many years and and on some subjects i still learn after 30 years on 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 my subjects it's it's just it's a it's a long process and and yeah you have to have endurance and patience and and yeah connections that's that's what i say <laughs> perfect i think that's yeah very um very insightful into you know identifying that it can't be done just by one individual there are plenty of knowledgeable people out there mm -hmm. um and and we should make most of of one of the best resources that conservation has and and that is you know the knowledge of of the people around us and and the people that that share the same passions as us mm -hmm. and so alex that does give us a lovely wonderful insight into to your career so we're just going to finish up the episode with some some fun questions just to uh to have a bit of a light-hearted moment because conservation like I say is very taxing it's it's something that you never you never truly done with so for a for a man that's that's um been around the world and seen lots of species you may have seen all of the species that you ever anticipated seeing but are there any you know species that you'd absolutely love to see in the wild yes of course <laughs> there's a lot of very nice species i would love to see obviously 
my my favorite one would be cats huh? and i think i would love to see a marble cat in the wild or a clouded leopard um, and i've seen quite a lot of cat species um but those small smaller uh, asiatic rainforest species are very hard to see and and i must admit i haven't i have been often to the neotropical areas and i've never seen a cat i've never seen a cat in the new world so I mean, if this is the old, the old term is, is still permissible. So I haven't seen a single cat species in North or South America. Um, so yeah, the, these are definitely top of my list, but I'm, I generally love all kinds of wildlife. So, so uh, I love birds, reptiles, um, mammals. Um, there is so many I would like to see. And, but definitely if I, if I would have the choice, I would go for, for the rare cat species, which are difficult to see. <laughs> and then moving on oh, was kind of similar then if if you know if you could live anywhere or spend an extended amount of time anywhere is there a particular com continent that has kind of stolen your heart i i can definitely say that that southern africa is is my second home so i'm 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 german i'm living in germany but definitely uh, southern africa i have spent an, a significant amount of my of my life there and and it's really my my home so it's 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 my heart my heart is there <laughs> so but it's yeah it's 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 possible and and um i will continue traveling there and staying there for for many weeks a year so that's that's definitely my plan yes yeah i think there's certainly a reason why um tourism is very popular out in in africa with regards to the wildlife that's found there so yeah um, certainly, um, I've never been. One day, I'm sure I'll get out there. Um, when you're not working, how do you keep busy? Obviously, again, like we've said, we do dedicate our lives to to conservation, but it's important to to have something to take your mind off of it. So, how do you keep busy when you're not working with animals? I mean, my big hobby is obviously is photography. I I have I have started when I was eleven with photography and bird watching. So for wildlife photography, nature photography is my favorite, and and I spend a big amount of my time on it. And uh, first of all, doing all my travels, and then uh, the processing of the pictures, and and actually disseminating it to, to to a degree. And and obviously, social media is now the way. You know, I have two social media sites. Obviously, mine. Alexander Sliver, and the second one is Blackfooted Cat Life. It's called, and and I'm posting every four days something on it, and I'm and I'm trying to always select a nice picture, and then obviously uh, write an informative short text with it. So so yeah, the public and and more and more people subscribing are are getting an insight, and and I think I'll, and that obviously came from my children. I have three girls uh, in their twenties, and they have encouraged me to do this because they say <laughs> this is the future. This is the future of, of influencing future conservationist people, you know, getting them fired up for the nature. So that's that's a big part of my life. And then obviously just staying fit because mm -hmm. I want to stay fit. I'm, I'm not a, a fitness nut. But <laughs> I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> so working out a bit, walking at least an hour and a half today, every day, uh, just to, you know, just to clear my mind, just to keep keep the body working because I still want to do field work hopefully into my 70s <laughs> um yeah that's that's essentially it and obviously sometimes i switch off you know just watching a nature documentary or reading a book um but that's actually quite rare so so i'm i'm mostly active in my in my private time <laughs> fantastic and and thank you for providing um you know the 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 names of your instagram pages and um, certainly We'll be directing our listeners to see how they can connect with you online. And um, so, last question then: What is is one thing that you you think our listeners should take away from today's episode? I hope that uh, they become interested in the small wildcats. Um, I think that's that's really worthwhile. They're fantastic. They're beautiful, interesting. There's so many facts to learn. I'm really hoping that they will look into this and and I'm happy to provide contacts and or, or, or links to that. Um, yeah, that's that's essentially what I, I really would love is is in, and that's my mission, I could say, you know, and that's that's not just the zoo, but it's also my private and everything that I do is is towards the small wildcats. And but generally, I'm just hoping that people are aware, you know, about the fantastic variety and 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 beauty of nature and their yeah and their creatures it's uh we are also part of it and and i really hope that that they will take away this from this today's podcast 
I certainly hope so too. Alex, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's it's been incredibly insightful, and and yes, uh, I think you've you've done a fantastic job of of highlighting that. When we think about felines, there's certainly a you know a, a large overlooked community of of species that that we really could be doing a lot more for, and and so um yeah, hopefully um we'll get a few more people involved and and certainly i know from from the podcast sake we'll be uh continuing to to monitor what's going on in the world of, of small cats and um, so yeah, again thank you for your time it's a great pleasure thank you johnny i really enjoyed uh yeah talking to you discussing with you great thank you well folks that's a wrap on another exhilarating episode of the conservationist assembly podcast Dr. Alex served up some serious wisdom that I hope has left you feeling inspired. If you do feel this way, then don't be shy. Show some love for this podcast and Alex's work by giving them a follow on Instagram and spreading the word. And hey, if you're feeling extra generous, drop a rating and share it with your favourite people. This way we can keep the good work going and bring you more epic conservation heroes. So a big thank you for tuning in and don't forget to catch us next time for another awesome wildlife adventure.